It's Wednesday, October 8, 2014, and this is KBIA's Views of the News. Our weekly roundtable on media behaviors comes to you from the Futures Lab studio at the Reynolds Journalism Institute. I'm Amy Simons, and here with me are Missouri School of Journalism colleagues, Jim Flink, and a welcome member, new to our radio television faculty, Jamie Graber. Welcome, Jamie. We're excited to have you here with Thank us. Thank you so much. We're going to spend a lot of time talking in this next half hour about Ebola and how the media has covered it these last few weeks. We're also going to talk about John Oliver. He says his HBO show is entertainment, not journalism, but there are plenty of journalists out there who disagree. Sure, he's another Daily Show alum, but his brand of comedy takes a decidedly different approach. I'll ask our panelists about it. And October baseball is in full swing on both sides of the Show Me State. In St. Louis, it's old hat, but for Royals fans, it's something to behold. We'll look at the coverage and talk a bit about that. There's a lot more hopefully we're going to get to as well, but I want to start with this. The Ebola story has spread across the media with the speed of a frightening virus, and that's often how it's portrayed. Happening now, breaking news. Ebola quarantine residents locked down in the Texas apartment where the man with the first case of the disease diagnosed in the United States was staying. Our ABC News medical team is covering it all. We begin in Dallas where Ebola has the city on edge this morning as we learn more about the man infected with the deadly virus. Another frightening story developing right now, Ebola here in the United States. And tonight there are growing fears that it could spread. It's now touched our extended family. A photojournalist working with Dr. Nancy Snyderman and her team in Liberia has tested positive for Ebola. No matter where you turn, on air, in print, online, news about the outbreak is everywhere. And we're going to get into some of the particulars that you heard in that clip. But I want to start by asking both of you for your reactions to the coverage so far. Well, for, for me, um, what I just saw in that clip is very emblematic of what, and, and I spent 20 years in broadcast television, what I do not like about the pace of broadcast uh, television. And we're going to get into a lot of issues today where the media could be delving into explanatory journalism and contextual storytelling and that kind of thing. But the breathless writing and pacing of this kind of story with the lack of context creates an environment in which there can be misunderstanding, and that is not what journalists ought to be engaged in. Sure, and I think we see that especially a lot of those clips where the 24-hour news uh, cycles where you have more time to tell a story, yet we often see what you're talking about, which is the quick, breathless nature, and this is happening now. You need to be concerned about this right now. This is breaking news. This is breaking news right now, urgent news right now. Those are the kinds of things that can really get people into kind of a panic and have an unnecessary fear in some ways. But I have seen some good journalism, some reassurance, some explanations, some doctors coming on and explaining what Ebola is, how it travels, how to keep yourself safe, those types of things. So I think we've seen a little a little of, of both ends of the spectrum. I do too. And, you know, the, the only thing that I would say about it is that unfortunately in this uh, era of glance news and sort of, um, you know, very short attention spans, short engagement patterns, what's, what I'm afraid is getting lost in all of this is that we're seeing that, but we're not getting, Jamie, what you're talking about, which is contextual. Now, I do believe people are searching for it, but I know, not that my family is represented, but I've had conversations in my own family with my 13-year-old and, and with my wife about what is the danger Danger. What is the risk? And and in searching for those answers, we ought to be able to find that in a lot of places like the four networks. So here is one of those more cringeworthy moments we've been talking about. This one's from Fox News's Outnumbered panel. They were talking about the virus spreading in this country when Andrew Tintero said this. I'll say it before, I'll say it again. In these countries, they do not believe in traditional medical care. So someone could get off a flight and seek treatment from a witch doctor that practices Santeria. This is a bigger fear. We're, we're hoping that they come to the hospitals yeah. in the U.S. They might not. So she actually just blamed the spread of Ebola on people going to witch doctors. It wasn't all that long ago we were talking about people on Fox News as well blaming um, the victims in the Ray Rice scandal with that tape coming out saying, take the mm -hmm. stairs. How does this keep happening? Well, it keeps happening because uh, we're br we're trying to offer multiple points of view, I suppose, is, is part of it. And so I think what, what we're seeing is um, we want to have discussions that are engaging and, and, and interesting, but 
to to mischaracterize the entire state of of um, of a medical uh, situation in a country and and boil it down to some anecdotal story really does a disservice on so many levels. I think it's irresponsible to say certain things, uh, even if it is perhaps some type of opinion that somebody has. It's it's not responsible to take the platform that you have in that situation. You are on national television. Um Understand it, the responsibility that goes with that. It, it, it's yeah. It, I mean, that's what it is. It's a responsibility thing. But we're seeing it on on the twenty four hour and, cable and comments like these. Really, all that they're really doing by spreading these untruths is promoting xenophobia more than anything else. Right. Well, and and the problem with it is is that um, that. That thought, first of all, it does plant the seed, and then people go to an aha moment, and this becomes the new truth. And we talked last week a little bit about misinformation being seeded. Well, this is how misinformation gets seeded. Somebody states a very strong opinion as fact, without context, without larger understanding. Uh, people who think very similarly to that individual then grab it. It goes viral, and before you know it, there's this new truth that you have to debunk that, that has grown into a life of its own. And with a phrase that was pretty quickly and I would say hastily mm-hmm. said, then it does plant that seed. And where does it unravel from there? I think. Well, you, you can spend a lot of time. Yeah, you can spend a lot more time now having to disprove that and really break down what is the medical medical situation in Liberia. What is you know what is the belief in witch doctors? How prevalent is it? And this becomes now just from that one statement. You have to do a great deal of work now to provide the context that's needed. Okay, well, let's talk about some of that better stuff that's out there, mm-hmm. things that we should be looking at instead of these untruths. We've linked to several examples of good, functional, explanatory journalism on our blog on the KBIA website, and we invite you to take a, a deeper look at some of those. One of my favorites is an interactive from the New York Times that answers almost every question you can imagine as you scroll through the page. It has maps that show where there have been outbreaks and what conditions the patients are in each of those places timelines that are plotted out on calendars to show how much time has elapsed between exposure and when patients have shown signs of the illness and their diagnosis, shows the development of drugs used to treat the illness and everything else. There are some other examples of things there too. What are some of the ones you've seen that you've liked specifically? Sure. I think one that uh, a colleague at uh, KOMU actually pointed out to me uh, was an article that was published in Vanity Fair that traces back uh, the original person that likely started, uh, that that contracted this particular strain of Ebola, and it follows uh, that particular person's diagnosis, in this case it was a young boy, uh, and it travels along and shows exactly how Ebola spread and why in this case Ebola is spreading more rapidly and farther than in previous cases of Ebola. It gives context, helps you understand, uh, it gives you insight into cultures that we uh, here in America are are not really exposed to that often unless you've had the ability to go travel there. So I think context explaining a culture that you do not understand in a realistic way is important, and yeah. that Vanity Fair does that. Yeah, and I, I saw a couple of uh, British uh, publications. The BBC, I think, did a really good job because they actually had some interviews, some visuals, and some videos. And, you know, like it or not, a lot of people who are going to get their information on this are going to get this in the form of some short burst themselves. And so a contextualized video talking with people who either were related to folks who contracted Ebola and Ebola, and then also they themselves had it and survived. You know, those kinds of stories at least help to provide a little bit of context. If we can do this in, in charts and graphs and in, and in video in particular, where a lot of people are consuming their media, I think it's helpful. There's another site that we're expecting to be able to see in the next week or so. It's supposed to launch sometime around October 15th called Ebola Deeply, coming mm-hmm. from the same group mm-hmm. behind the site Syria mm-hmm. Deeply. What, times, what types of things have we seen there, and how might that translate to this? This topic as well. Well, I, I'll let you jump in on that, but I mean, I think I think wherever we can get into real stories, real people, real experiences, and and get deeper into the stories of of um, how people survive, 
um, how it spreads. There was a very good interactive map about talking about where this particular strain, you know, uh, Ebola first appeared in the mid 70s, but now this is actually coming from a different part of Africa, explaining that out. Whenever you get those kinds of opportunities to really go deep dive into context, especially with a public health issue, that's a great thing. I think the word we all keep saying here, and, and this should hopefully provide, is context. Anytime there is <laughs> that, that is the magic saying, word on this show. <laughs> I, I mean, and anytime we can change the name to context, context. instead of views of the news. <laughs> we need more context. I mean, I think that's that's what people are looking for and what they need when we're talking about something this critical. Okay. Well, there was one thing that struck me about that New York Times piece. In the section where it listed each of those patients and their conditions, it used characteristics to identify the patients. It was aid worker, doctor, NBC cameraman. What it didn't use was names. Well, not at first, at least. As you scroll down a little bit, you will see the name of Thomas E. Duncan. Duncan is the Liberian man who traveled to Dallas while contagious. He died earlier today, and so far, none of the dozens of people who he may have exposed to the illness have shown any signs of having contracted it. Um, the fact that Duncan has since passed as a result of his infection, it changes things slightly. Um, when somebody does die, there becomes a public record through a coroner's office or a medical examiner. But before that happened today, before that information came mm -hmm. out, we did all know his name. Mm -hmm. is, I want to ask you, would you have named him in that situation as, as a private citizen of whatever country that might be? Did he have a right to a greater sense of privacy than what he got? Well, I've thought a lot about this, and because he did get named pretty uh, early on, no, not immediately would be my first response. That's because I would have weighed public interest and public need to know. Um, if there is a safety risk so great that knowing this person's name could potentially save people, then you weigh it that way. But in this case, you need to weigh that against the protection of someone. Are you risking that person's safety? Are you risking that person's reputation? In this case- Or the immediate family members who all sure. kind of became pariahs within mm -hmm. that community mm -hmm. and frankly across the country. Mm -hmm. And so you have to look at those things and, and weigh. But at the same time, we do release victim names sometimes in car crashes or uh, in, in different, types of uh, scenarios, but those are often released by the family. Those are released by officials for a specific and compelling reason, and that's why you have to have the conversation. I agree with, with everything that Jamie said. I mean, I think it is an expectation of privacy versus the, what's good for the greater good, and and so as a reporter, that's a lot of uh, that's a lot of power that's placed in your hands over the fate and the and and the livelihood of individuals or families and that kind of thing. You know, would I have done it? Um, you know, I think I would have asked some other questions around this. Um, some did, examples. For, for example, did Thomas Duncan know, did he have reason to believe that he had been exposed to the Ebola virus before he returned to the country? I think that the answer to that was possibly yes. Um, mm -hmm. I think that uh, then did he understand the gravity of that? Would he have understood that in the role that he played? I would have asked myself a series of questions before I said, do I make his name public or not? And, and frankly, that is a lot of uh, power that you put in the hands of journalists who get information. But I think if I answered yes to enough of those questions, I think I would use it. And I think in this case, I might have said yes on the very seminal point of he was exposed in a very public way to, in Africa to someone who had Ebola. And I think he should have known uh, the dangers. If he didn't, um, that's unfortunate. And to clarify, um, to I would not have immediately named him. It's the conversation after. And I think uh, talking about some news outlets did that. NPR, in fact, uh, did not initially name him while other sources were, but eventually made that decision to weighing a lot of the things we just talked about. Okay, well, somebody else who was practically unknown to Americans a week ago, Ashoko Mukbu, uh, Mukpo, sorry. The freelance photographer had joined an NBC crew in Liberia a few days before he started to feel symptoms. Here's NBC medical reporter Dr. Nancy Snyderman telling Matt Lauer what happened last Thursday on the Today Show. 
We're going to get right to our top story. As we mentioned, it's now touched our extended family. A photojournalist working with Dr. Nancy Snyderman and her team in Liberia has tested positive for Ebola. Dr. Nancy is with us now by phone from Monrovia. Nancy, good morning to you. How is this young man, Ashoka Mukpo, doing? Um, hi, Matt. He sounded this morning well. Um, this has been quite an odyssey the last 48 hours. And, of course, when he realized that he had a fever and was feeling achy in this environment, um, the word Ebola popped to the top of everyone's mind. Uh, he self-quarantined overnight 48 hours ago, got his test. It turned out to be positive. And at that point, uh, it was all, it's all been a matter of logistics of stabilizing him. Uh, he's a Doctors Without Borders, and he will be airlifted out to a medical center in the United States. So um, he is now in the United States undergoing mm-hmm. treatment. Uh, we're told his prognosis is good, although I don't know if any, in that his viral load is relatively mm-hmm. low, mm-hmm. although I don't know if anybody who has Ebola, even with a low viral load, that's necessarily a good thing. Um, he says he thinks that he was exposed while cleaning out a car that had been contaminated, but had otherwise taken all the precautions necessary. It's a reminder those precautions are just precautions and that journalists out there covering the story are putting themselves at risk to bring this information home to us as viewers, readers, listeners, etc. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, we've had a lot of reminders of the danger that journalists, particularly in international climates, put themselves in to let the rest of us here know what's going on. And, um, you know, he's sounded like he was taking the precautions. The team that was with him from NBC was also doing that, is still doing that, quarantining themselves. And so, yeah, I mean, it's a reminder and this can happen. Making a decision to go cover that story uh, is it can be a life or death decision. I think any, any journalist who goes into that situation, similar to going into a war zone or whatever, understands um, that they are going into a risky situation. The mistake that you can't make is finding yourself in this particular situation, as far as I'm concerned, finding yourself in a situation where you think that exposure might happen and ignoring that. It appears that he didn't do that. And I think the key to this, as you said, is uh, getting to it early in terms of treatment and being responsible with it and letting viewers know right. what they're doing in fact the, the reason uh she was on the phone was because their camera equipment was contaminated and they couldn't use it anymore because of that and i think that's showing responsibility and showing uh, how seriously they are taking ebola well i want to shift gears. There are lots of other things going on as well. Um, I want to talk for a minute about John Oliver. When his new program launched earlier this year, he said that the show would deliver headlines with some commentary and some laughs, but he was adamant last week with John Oliver would not be journalism. The show's been on for a few months, and the more we're seeing of it, the more we're seeing examples of what we would call Big J journalism emerging. Take, for example, the reporting that had to have gone into this excerpt, uh, an investigation into scholarships given through the Miss America pageant system. But it was then, while digging around on their site, that we discovered that Miss America and its foundation are registered non-profits, which means they have to file public tax forms. So what we were looking for was that crazy number, $45 million. What we found instead was that in 2012, at the national level, they spent less than $500,000 in cash scholarships, leaving us a mere $44.5 million short of what they say they provide. And at this point, we really had a clear choice. We could have just thought, sure, the numbers don't really add up, but it's only Miss America who really gives a <laughs> Or, or we could try to pull the tax forms from every state-level competition in the country because this was starting to drive us f***ing insane. It's been a weird week here. You may have heard that thump. That was Oliver plopping a pile of documents eight inches tall onto the table. And this Sunday, Columbia's own police chief, Ken Burton, showed up in a segment on civil asset forfeiture. And at this point, you may be thinking, well, sure, the police departments are getting a lot of money from seizing stuff, but I'm sure there are limitations on how they can spend it. Well, allow me to take you to a 2012 Columbia, Missouri Citizen Police Review Board hearing. 
how do you decide forfeiture funds? You know, it's usually based on a need. Um, well, I'll take that back. Discretion, though, I'd imagine you, you sign off on? Yeah, it's there's some limitations on it. You know, it's um, actually there's not really on the forfeiture stuff. Actually, there's basically no limitations at all. Come to think of it, there's uh, we're essentially gods. We're gods. We're, we're like the anti-Spider-Man. Great power, no responsibility. I can't believe this hasn't come up before. And look, his honesty was not over. It's, it's, we just usually base it on something that would be nice to have, that we, we, we can't get in the budget, for, for instance. So, you know, we try not to use it for things that we need to depend on, you know, because we need to go ahead and have those purchased. But it's kind of like pennies from heaven, you know, it gets you a, a toy or something that you need, is, is the way we typically look at it. That's right, that's right. They buy toys with pennies from heaven. So I'm guessing that's video that the Columbia Police Department, the Police Review Board, the City Council, probably not happy about having show up on national television, but it's out there. That was originally on public access television. I, I know I sit home and watch City Council meetings every other Monday night. I'm not sure what that says about me, but... I invite folks to go to our links blog and watch both of those segments. They're each about 15 minutes long mm -hmm. and see the reporting that's going into them. I, I, my opinion, it's journalism there. I don't think there's any question it's journalism. They're digging into well, records. John They're, Oliver doesn't want to think it's journalism. Right. Well, <laughs> you know, but it doesn't serve him to yeah, say that yeah. this is journalism. It serves him to say that this is entertainment. But but this is the great juxtaposition. You know, we, we've been talking about the 24-7 news cycle. This is the kind of program that we ought to be seeing on news channels. It's, it's entertaining. It's engaging. It's comedy, maybe... Only in the respect that you can't believe that it's real life, and it really is sort of answering some questions like, how does this stuff work? Mm -hmm. I, I think the difference is, I, I certainly don't have the delivery that he has, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think I don't think I could pull it off as an investigative journalist. But uh, I don't think this was exactly the way I went about things, um, and so I think his delivery is one thing. I also think that. He, Stephen Colbert, mm -hmm. John Stewart, all these, I mean, they have a lot of news value in them. Mm -hmm. He did something that no other journalist, at least that I've seen, has, has looked exactly into these issues the way that he did. However, he also doesn't have an obligation to be balanced. Right let's say. He can be flabbergasted by something. That's not something that I would advocate for being on a television station that I work for in um, local television network affiliates. Certainly it doesn't meet some of the standards of journalism. This is the one thing that I would say on the flip side of that about the Columbia Police Chief. Please understand that it doesn't matter if you're on local access. It, you know, if you're a public official, I think you start, are to start ought to start operating under the premise. Everything is being recorded. Everything is being recorded. Everywhere that you go, there is no such thing as a private comment anymore. And please begin to operate on that premise because otherwise you're going to end up on national television. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, this next story is another one that hits a little close to home. Monday night, Emmy-nominated actress Laverne Cox spoke to a full house at the Missouri Theater. Cox, a transgender woman, has gained fame for her role on the Netflix series Orange is the New Black. Her celebrity brought out reporters, including one from KOMU, the Tribune, the Missourian, and the Maneater, but only one used Cox's birth name. It was removed from the web story just after 7 p.m. last night from the Missourian's web story um, after a reader left a critical comment on the Missourian's Facebook page. It never appeared in print with that name. Um, we're not going to use Laverne Cox's birth name here partially because, well, mainly because it's considered offensive to people who identify as trans to not recognize using the identity that they hold. And she specifically identifies as Laverne Cox, so that's the name that, that we, we would end up using. Um, Jamie, you and I had the privilege, the honor this morning of having been invited to the Missourians editorial meeting when there was some post-mortem being done on the decisions that had been made in the last 12 to 14 to 16 hours. What were some of the takeaways that you had from that meeting? Well, I think looking at this, there was the, the decision to take that name out. And from the conversation, it seems as though the intent 
was to clarify and to offer readers an explanation of Laverne Cox's history. However, Especially for those who may not be familiar with Orange is the New Black, Netflix being a subscription service, the idea mm -hmm. that maybe the audience reach isn't as far or as deep as a college student or people in a college town mm -hmm. might take for granted. Or simply people who may not be familiar with the term transgender and what that means. And so I think the intent was clarification. I think the result was the opposite of clarification. And on top of that, could be taken and obviously was taken by some as offensive. I think the difficulty is in this is this is not a discussion that's happening in enough newsrooms across the country. And I think uh, hopefully what, what cases like this do is it does engender more discussion about particularly the transgender um, addressing that whole uh, issue as as far, far as a societal issue, but also really talking about it in terms of really um, the individual that's involved. What is their what is their story? Which part of their story do they want to reveal? You know, and then you still get into expectations of privacy and that kind of thing because this is obviously a very public figure. But I mean, I do think it's a discussion that that we need to have on any one of a number of different levels that isn't. I don't think happening in mm -hmm. a lot of newsrooms and needs to be. Well, and that's something that we discussed going back to last winter when there was an, uh, a story that was published by ESPN's Grantland about mm -hmm. a transgender woman who was outed in, in a story um, having to do with a golf club sale scam. Mm -hmm. And in that case, it resulted in a suicide because that person wasn't out as transgender to the people who were involved in the story or to the greater audience, to the greater world. And we talked at that point, too, about conversations not happening in the newsrooms. Um, one of the things and themes that came up in the Missourian meeting this morning was transparency. Mm -hmm. And the idea that perhaps there was room for more transparency mm -hmm. on the Missourian story about the changes that had been made from the time of initial publication to the first change to then removing it again. And in the interest of transparency, I want to make sure that we're clear about the fact that um, I have a student who works as an associate producer on this program mm -hmm. and it has contributed to this episode as well, mm -hmm. who also works in the Missourian. And uh, Josie Herrera was also one of the copy editors right. who worked on this story mm -hmm. right. um, at the Missourian and was also um, in the audience Monday night when Laverne Cox was speaking. And Josie heard firsthand when Laverne Cox said in that event that... Um, she does not at any point use or mention her birth name. Her name is Laverne Cox and mm -hmm. has and always will be. And Josie used that information in the editing that she did on the story. That firsthand experience and that um, context wasn't communicated throughout the 15, 16 hour time period in the Missourians newsroom so that the information wasn't all necessarily there. Very quickly before we go, Royals fans? Yes, absolutely, and Cardinal fans. <laughs> and Cardinal Both. fans. Well, uh, tough lesson learned for the fine folks at MLB.com. Can't right. necessarily Ooh. rely on uh, that Pub early gamer. Publishing a story that the Royals had lost when, in fact, they had run won the, the game. The game wasn't even over the yet. The game wasn't that, over. No, it up in this day and age, just make the edit and then push back. Okay. Well, and maybe it just goes to show, you know, underdogs all the way to the end. <laughs> well, let's, let's see what happens now, in, in the championship series coming up in the next few days. We're pretty much out of time this week. I'd like to thank you for joining us. Make sure you're following us on Facebook or also on Twitter. Our handle is at uh, views at KBIA. These are all great ways to watch and listen to our program again. Leave us comments, questions, see what we'll be talking about next week and more. Our thanks to Travis McMillan for directing today's show and to Pat Akers for handling the audio. Hope Kerwin and Josie Herrera are our associate producers. I'm Amy Simons. Join us again next week for another edition of Views of the News.